All right, AP Physics 1, it's time for a new unit, Unit 5 on Linear Momentum. And while the last unit, which was on circular motion and field forces, was it sometimes a little heady because we can't see gravitational fields, we can't see electric fields, linear momentum is very, very tangible and arguably one of the most practical units that we're going to talk about all year. Now, this lesson is going to be specifically about the ideas of momentum and impulse, which are both words that you're familiar with, but we're going to learn that they have very specific physics definitions. Additionally, I want to briefly note that a lot of what we're learning in this unit is really a reformulation of what we learned in previous units. We're going to look at problems that in many ways look very, very similar, but we're going to see that looking at them in a momentum framework rather than frameworks we've learned previously will be very, very useful at times. So what is momentum in a physics sense? Well, first off, annoyingly, we abbreviate it with a lowercase p. I don't know why that is. That is just convention. But what momentum is, is we can think of it as a measurement of inertia in motion. Well, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, that is, we're talking about how much mass and how much motion an object has. Because recall, inertia is really just the mass of an object, that inertial mass. So if an object has more mass, it will have more momentum. If it has more motion, it will have momentum. So momentum is quantifying these two particular things. Now we can calculate it pretty simply with P equals mv, where P is the momentum, m is the inertial mass in kilograms, and v is the velocity in meters per second. Now, what are the units of momentum? Well, this is kilograms, meters per second. Well, it's literally just kilograms times meters per second. We don't have a specific unit like Newton uh, for this. It's just kilograms times meters per second. There's no other fancy word for it. Additionally, momentum is a vector quantity, meaning it has magnitude and it has direction, which makes sense. The mass is not a vector, but velocity is. So if an object's velocity is to the right, its momentum will be to the right. If its velocity is to the left, its momentum will be to the left. So let's look at a very simple example. How much inertia and how much momentum does a four kilogram bowling ball have as it, and then we've got three possibilities here. For A, rolls of three meters per second to the right, B rolls at 2 meters per second to the left, or C sits at rest. Well, let's look at A. As it rolls at 3 meters per second to the right, well, its inertia is just going to be 4 kilograms. It's measured by its inertial mass. But its momentum will be that mass times its velocity. So 4 kilograms times 3 meters per second will be 12 kilograms meters per second. And since the velocity is to the right, the momentum is to the right. Now let's look at B. Rolls at 2 meters per second to the left. Well, we already know that the inertia is still 4 kilograms. It's just the mass. And the momentum should be that mass times the velocity, so it should be 8 kilograms meters per second to the left. But what if it sits at rest? Well, if an object sits at rest, it still has inertia. Remembering that inertia is this tendency to resist changes in motion, the ability to just not get pushed too much by forces. So if that's the case, the inertia is still four kilograms, but the momentum is now zero because the velocity is zero since it is at rest. And this is really, really crucial. This is what distinguishes inertia from momentum. Momentum requires motion. So let's look at this another example real quick. What is the change in momentum of this ball when it collides with this wall. So this ball here has a mass of 0.5 kilograms and has a current velocity of six meters per second. And then after it collides with the wall, this is the wall here, we're gonna say it has a velocity of zero. So what is the change in momentum of this ball when this occurs? Well, we can say that delta P, well, it's not gonna be MV now because now we have a change in momentum, but what changed? Well, not the mass. So what is gonna change is the velocity. So we want to remember this relationship that delta P is really going to typically be M delta V. Most objects we look at, their masses don't change. It's their velocities that change. So if that being the case, we just stick in that M is going to be V final minus V initial. So when we subtract 6 from 0 and then multiply it 0.5, we get minus 3 kilograms meters per second. And what is this minus sign here telling me? Well, initially, we were assuming that the positive direction was to the right because we said this was positive six. And if that's the case, 
negative is the left. So what we're saying really is that this has a change of momentum of three kilograms meters per second to the left. So you either could have said minus three kilograms meters per second or three kilograms meters per second to the left. Well, let's change the situation up slightly and say, okay, well, it's moving at six meters per second and then it hits the wall and bounces back at two meters per second. And we want to know what is the change in momentum now? So go ahead and pause this and see if you can figure out that change of momentum, then come back. Hopefully you gave it a shot, and if you did, you might have done something like this, where you said, well, m delta v is 0.5, and the final is 2, and the initial is 6, so we get minus 2 kilograms meters per second. And this is wrong. This is not quite right. Because what we need to remember is that when it's going to the right, we were saying this was positive, so that means when it's going to the left, this is going to be a negative velocity. So instead of 2 minus 6, the change in velocity is actually going to be negative 2 minus 6. So I have the mass is 0.5 kilograms. The final velocity is negative 2. The initial velocity is positive 6. So we get negative 2 minus 6 is going to be what? Um, negative 2 minus 6 would be negative 8 times 0.5, we get negative 4 kilograms meters per second. And this makes sense, because what this is telling me is, remember the original situation was minus 3, and that's when it stopped. Well, now the change in momentum is even more. It not only had a change in momentum where it just stopped here, its momentum is actually reversing directions. So it is a greater change in momentum when it is recoiling, when it's bouncing off of the wall. But how exactly does inertia and momentum really connect. We kind of talked about it a little bit, but let's go into a little more detail. Let's recall Newton's first law of motion, which is that if the forces on an object are balanced, the motion of the object remains constant. And we learned that is by saying, okay, well, that means that the net force is zero because the forces are balanced. That means the acceleration is zero and V is therefore constant. It's a constant velocity. And we said that if an object has inertia, it resists this acceleration and will continue on at a constant velocity. But if the velocity is constant, and keeping in mind that the mass is probably constant, well that means if p equals mv, if this is a constant and m is a constant, well then the momentum is going to be a constant too. So we can actually rewrite Newton's first law as if the forces on an object are balanced, the momentum of the object will remain constant. If the object is at rest, its momentum is zero. So, if its momentum is zero, it will continue to have zero momentum. It will continue to not move unless a net force acts on it. If it has some momentum, so if it's moving in some direction at a constant velocity, it will continue that momentum, that same value, until a net force is applied to it. Well, let's take that a step further, because remember, Newton's first law is really just a special case of Newton's second law, which said if the forces on an object are unbalanced, well, then the object's going to accelerate. And we said specifically that that acceleration was equal to the net force over the mass of the object. Okay, well, how can we redefine this a little bit? Well, first off, that means, we can kind of already figure this out from the previous slides, that if the forces on an object are unbalanced, well then the momentum of the object can't be constant. It has to change. And how exactly would we see that? Well, acceleration is just change in v, or the change in velocity over the change in time. And let's go ahead and say I multiply this m across, so I get m delta v over delta t. Well, m delta v, we already found, is the change in momentum. So this is telling me that the change in momentum with respect to the change in time is equal to the net force. In other words, if the forces are unbalanced, the momentum will change. But let's look at that relation one more time. The delta P over delta T is equal to the force. The change in momentum over the change in time is equal to the force. And let's say we only have one force here, so we don't need to worry about the net force. We'll just say it's this singular force that we're looking at. All right, well, if this is the case, well, I could go ahead and say I can multiply this delta T across, and I'll get delta P is equal to F times delta T. And this particular combination here on the right, F delta T, is something actually known as impulse. It is known specifically, that is the phrase for it, is impulse. The impulse on an object will be F delta T. Now, impulse is sometimes abbreviated as J. I've seen it abbreviated as I. 
we're not going to worry about using either one of those. We're just going to remember that the impulse, F delta T, is also equal to delta P, because this is something known as the impulse momentum theorem. It's not really much of a theorem. It's really just saying that these are all the same. That delta P, the change in momentum, is equal to M delta V, the mass times the change in velocity. We already saw that which is also equal to F delta T, the force times the change in time. Now, a couple things on units here. These units were kilograms, meters per second, force times change in time, that's really would be newtons times seconds or newton seconds. These units are identical. Um, a kilogram, meter per second, and a newton second are the same thing. So I don't care which unit you use, you just need to be consistent. But really the key point here is that impulse, when we see this word impulse, you need to automatically think change in momentum. When you see impulse, you should automatically think delta P. Automatic. Immediately jump to this, because that is what the impulse momentum theorem tells us. Now, you might be thinking, though, why do I really care about F delta T? You know, why is that, why is this impulse thing so important? So, let's look at that. Now, we were previously looking at this example with the ball hitting the wall, and we said that if it goes at it at 6 and leaves at 2, keeping in mind this is the positive direction and this is the negative direction, then the change in momentum was negative 4 kilograms meters per second. We already solved this problem. And if you were then asked this question, though, how much force does the wall apply to the ball during the collision, well, how could we answer that? How could I say how much force the wall is applying to the ball? And you might think, okay, well, we have a delta P, and Mr. Varvier literally just told us that there's this relationship of delta P equals F delta T. But what is this delta T? Is that the amount of time it takes the ball to get to the wall? The amount of time it takes to move away from the wall the whole time? Um, what is that delta T specifically. Well, now we're getting to something that is very, very realistic that previously we've not considered, which is that forces are not applied instantaneously. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the ball on the wall again. Initially, the ball starts to hit the wall. Like, this is the moment where they're, like, barely, barely touching. And this is when the collision starts, when the wall and the ball are colliding. And we would say that T0 is equal to zero here. Well, as this collision continues, we're actually going to see something happen, which is that the ball will actually start to compress. Because this is realistically what happens. The ball is not going to be perfectly solid all the time. It's going to start to compress when it hits this collision. And in fact, the wall is even going to compress a little bit too. It's going to be pushed in a little bit. And this is as time increases. And as the time increases some more, we're going to reach a point of we could say, for instance, maximum compression. When the ball is now as compressed as it gets, and the wall is pushed in as it gets, and then what's going to start happening is now the ball is going to start going back out, and it's going to start decompressing a little bit. The wall is going to stop compressing quite as much. And then we're even going to get to the point when the ball now leaves the wall, the collision ends, and they are both back to their normal shape. This is a very realistic way of looking at this, so that when the ball and the wall hit, they don't just, you know, instantaneously, pew. instead, they are going to, over a very small instant of time, going to compress, the wall is going to compress, and then they're going to go back out. And this takes time, specifically, this delta T is the time that the force is applied, or another way to think of it is this is the time of collision. This is the time the two objects are colliding, and it is the time that that compression takes place. It is the time that the wall is applying a force to this ball at all of these points, and then it literally stops right there. So this is the time that the force is applied. So let's go back to that previous example. So, we were already found this, and we know that the delta P is negative 4 kilograms meters per second, but how much force does the wall apply to the ball during the collision? Well, we need a little more information. We need to know specifically what this delta T is. And let's go ahead and say that this ball is made of rubber, and rubber is yeah, fairly compressible, and we'll say the wall is made of concrete. So the wall is still going to compress a little bit, but 
barely anything. It's going to barely compress because concrete is quite rigid. It is quite hard. So when these two hit each other, we'll say the collision is really, really quick. And this is actually quite realistic that the time of the collision might be one millisecond. In fact, this might be a little too big. It's going to be a very, very small amount of time. So this is the amount of time that the two are in contact, the amount of time that the collision takes place, the amount of time that the force is applied, the amount of time that they're both compressing and decompressing. So I stick this number into this equation, and I get negative four kilograms meters per second, which was our delta P, is F times 0 0.001 second, one millisecond. And now I can just solve by dividing across and I get that the force that the ball applies to, that the wall applies to the ball is negative 4,000 newtons. Keeping in mind this negative, all this negative is really telling you is that that force is to the left. So you could have easily have said the force is 4,000 newtons to the left. That is how hard the wall applies a force to the ball during this collision. But let's say the scenario was slightly different. So let's say the ball still underwent this same change in momentum. So it's still going from 6 meters per second to minus 2 meters per second. But now let's say um, we have a somewhat unrealistic situation. We say the wall is made of cheese. And cheese is, typically speaking, fairly soft. It's not very rigid. And so when these hit each other, the cheese is going to compress much more than the concrete did. And if it compresses much more before the ball bounces back, well, that means that time of collision is going to be much greater. And it might still be quite small, but it's going to be substantially bigger than it was previously. So the delta T now is 0 0.08 seconds. So let's now plug this into our equation. And we see that if I have negative 4 kilograms meters per second equals F times 0 0.08 seconds, we solve for F, and we get minus 15 newtons. And keep in mind, the previous one was 4,000 newtons. This is a humongous change in the force applied to the ball. The concrete wall applied a really big force. The cheese wall applied a very small force in comparison. So this is a really important conclusion we can draw from this. If an object undergoes a particular impulse, remembering that impulse just means change in momentum, delta P. So if I have some block, for instance, here, moving with some initial momentum, P naught, and then it hits and it stops moving, so it's a new momentum of zero. Well, that's a change in momentum, for sure. Well, how exactly can this go about happening? Well, if we keep the time of the collision really tiny, so if they collide for a very, very tiny amount of time, if that force is applied for a very, very tiny amount of time, that force applied is going to be huge. We're going to have a really big force acting on the object. But if instead we can maximize that time of collision, if we can make the time of collision bigger, if we can make that time of collision larger, the force applied on the object is much, much less. And this is an incredibly practical conclusion, something that is very, very important in our everyday lives. For instance, consider a car. Cars have many different safety mechanisms put in them to keep you safe if the car is to undergo a collision, aka the car crash. Well, what's one of the biggest one of these is the airbag. Well, what is the airbag doing? Well, if the airbag wasn't there and you hit, you know, an object, your head will go forward and smack off the steering wheel. And that steering wheel is quite rigid. It's usually made of some sort of plastic, something along those lines. So your head and the steering wheel, when they hit, the time of collision will be very, 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 very tiny. The force would be huge, and your brain is not going to like it. But let's say we put an airbag there. If we put an airbag there, your head goes forward, and it takes much, much longer for it to stop. Much, much longer for this change in momentum because the airbag compresses as your head hits it. It applies that force over a much longer amount of time. Well, that means the force on your head is much, 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 much less, and you are safe because your head can sustain that amount of force and not undergo a severe injury. Similarly, cars have something called crumple zones. Now, what crumple zones are, and this is a diagram of a car here, is this part where the passengers are is very, very um, rigid. It's built very, very securely. And also where the gas tank is is very, very secure. But at the front and back of the car, you'll actually have these joints in the car that when it undergoes a collision, these joints will actually collapse on themselves. They will literally crunch like a like an aluminum can 
And that's even what's happening here. You see the front of the car is getting crushed. And you've actually probably seen that, like, when people undergo a car crash, the front or back of the car might be completely smushed. And the reason why that is, is these crumple zones are built for two reasons. One, it's because we don't want this middle part to go crunch, because then your body goes crunch. Same thing with the gas tank. But the other reason is that by having this crumple zone, it takes longer for the collision to occur. And by taking longer for the collision to occur, you're reducing the force applied to the car, which reduces the force applied to this safety cell where the passengers are, and you reduce the odds that the passengers will be hurt. So we want to increase the time of collision by having some sort of compressibility in our objects to therefore decrease the force. Now, I do want to say that there is one thing we kind of left out, which is up to this point, we assumed that the force of the wall on the ball was constant. And in a lot of problems, we're going to deal with situations where we're going to treat that like the case. In fact, of most problems, we're going to treat it as if the force is constant, and we don't have to make things too complicated. But if we look at this, the force is not really constant. Because if I look at the beginning and end, the ball and the wall are barely touching. So the force is pretty much close to zero. And as they start to compress, the force the wall applies actually increases. And in fact, it's going to be at its maximum at that full compression point. Well, how can I analyze this if it's a non-constant force? Because if we look at delta P equals F delta T, there's no delta here. And if there's no delta F, well then I can't use this equation. So how do we go about solving that? Well, funny you should ask, we would actually use a graph. Now, this is a graph we've not seen before. It's specifically a force versus time graph, or F versus T. Remembering that force is on the vertical axis because it's in front, and time is on the horizontal axis, and so it is therefore, because it's a second variable, it will be there instead. So the force is in newtons, time is in seconds. And if we were to plot this, and these plots are not overly complicated, well, we would say, well, the maximum at F max was a time T2, and then at time T0, it was practically zero, and at T4, it was practically zero. And realistically, this would be a curve, but for simplicity's sake, we're going to go ahead and treat it pretty much like a straight peak, that initially the force applied on the ball was zero, and then it increases, increases, increases to that point of maximum compression, and then it decreases, decreases, decreases until the ball leaves the wall. Well, how can I find the impulse from here? Because remember, we've been using delta P is F delta T, and this is the impulse, but we can't use this equation anymore because this is not a constant force. Well, we can see that the impulse is some combination of F multiplied by T, so let's make a bit of a leap, and in fact, this is accurate, that the delta P, the impulse, is the area under this graph. So that area between the horizontal axis and the graph would be our delta P. So let's look at this specific situation, in fact, and let's say that the maximum force was 100 newtons, and let's say that the entire time of collision from zero to the end was 0 0.005 seconds, so 5 milliseconds. Well, if I was to find, uh, for instance, the delta P here, I would say, well, that's the area of this triangle, which would be 1 half base times height, and I would do 1 half times 0 0.005, that's the base, times the height, which is 100 newtons. If you multiply all those together, we get 0.25 kilograms meters per second. That would be the change in momentum of this particular object. Now, something we want to note, though, is if we look at this, this actually makes sense. Because what this is telling me is that if I combine the 1 half and the 100, this would actually be basically the average force. And so this is telling me if I look at the average force over this length of time, well, then that would be realistically uh, and reasonably the impulse, and that is in fact accurate. So what were the takeaways on our first lesson of Unit 5, Momentum and Impulse? One, can we determine the inertia, momentum, and change in momentum of an object? Two, can we utilize the impulse momentum theorem that delta P is equal to M delta V is equal to F delta T to relate changes in momentum to forces and times? Most importantly, arguably, can we conceptually explain how changing the amount of time a force is applied changes the size of the force? So if we increase the time that force is applied, the force applied will decrease. That is very, very practical. And lastly, can we utilize an F versus T graph to be able to solve some of these problems?